Hello chess lovers, Soren here and in this video I want to share with you an interesting game where American chess grandmaster Robert James Fisher demonstrates great endgame technique in a game against former world chess champion Vasily Smyslov. This game was played in 1965 at Capablanca Memorial. I have to tell you that the United States Department of State had restricted travel by Americans to Cuba and for those reasons, US chess champion Bobby Fischer was competing by teletype in a tournament that was being held in Havana. So Fischer was playing this game from New York. But before starting our game, first let me sharpen your tactical skills. Please take a look at this position with which Soviet chess grandmaster Eduard Gufeld and many other grandmasters played a trick on Bobby Fischer. In the comment section, I will leave the link of the video based on that story, but meanwhile, the task is to find mate in 4. I will wait for your answer in the comment section. Back to our main board where Fischer is playing with the white pieces and he opened up with e4. Smyslov responded with e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, we have the Rui Lopez, a6, Morphy defense, Bishop a4, knight f6, and d3, Fischer is choosing Anderson variation, a line which was once Adolf Anderson's favorite. With this old-fashioned line, uh, Fischer wants to surprise his opponent, but uh, before this, Smyslov had already played this line with the white pieces. d6 by Smyslov, c3, bishop e7, knight bd2, black castle's kingside, and knight f1. White differs castling and one of white's possible ideas can be starting a pawn push on the king's side, for example by playing h3 and g4. And then white can put his knight on g3, also in some cases knight e3 can be played. b5 by Smyslov, bishop b3 and d5. Well, according to Fischer, first playing d6 and then d5 is a loss of tempo and instead, in his book My 60 Memorable Games, Fischer suggests knight a5 followed by c5 but in our game after bishop b3 we have d5 here comes queen e2 d takes e4 d takes e4 and bishop e6 smyslov is offering the exchange of light squared bishop and is doing it in the cost of allowing the doubling of his pawns on the e-file in his analysis of this game in my 60 memorable games here is how fisher comments this move I was surprised that Smyslov was prepared to settle himself with doubled king pawns, but surmised that it must be alright since he doesn't do such things lightly. Anyway, without this exchange black's game would remain permanently cramped. Fischer captured on e6, f takes e6 and knight g3. Of course that knight on g3 is misplaced, but after castling kingside, Fischer wants to regroup his pieces. Queen d7. Fischer castled kingside and rook a d8. And only after rook a d8, Fischer understood Smyslov's idea. Smyslov now wants to offer the exchange of queens. In that game, it will be hard to make use of the weakness of black pawns. If only Fischer could guess black's idea, he would have gone for a4 instead of castling. And now if b takes c4, then queen c4. But in our game we have castling kingside and after rook a d8 a4, Smyslov played queen d3. Smyslov assumes that his doubled pawns should cause him little trouble in the ensuing endgame, but he underestimates white's winning chances and has for a cramped ending. Queen takes d3, rook takes d3, a takes b5, a takes b5, Black is controlling the d file while white has the control over the a file, which is more important. Rook a6 and rook d6. Black not only protected the knight but also created knight d4 threat. For example, now if you play bishop e3, then knight d4 will follow and black will damage white's pawn structure. That's why in our game after rook d6 we have king h1, a prophylactic move by Fischer. Knight d7 by Spassky. Well, in here it was very important to play b4. If c takes b4, then knight takes b4, and black is managing to solve almost all the problems. 
But instead, in our game after king h1, we have knight d7, bishop e3 by Fischer, rook d8. So none of the players is going for b4, and here is how Fischer commands it. Neither of us realized at this stage how essential this move was. h3 by Fischer, still it was not too late to go for b4, but we have h3, h6, rook a1. In his turn, Smyslov is not playing b4, in order not to surrender this c4 square. Knight d b8, rook a8, rook d1 check, and king h2. By the way, going for the exchange of rooks and then trying to make use of the vulnerability of the 8th rank won't work, because in the end of the day, black has this rook a1 move, and it's black who is winning, that's why in our game after rook d1 check we have king h2. Rook takes a1, rook takes a1, knight d7. Well, still, it was not too late to go for b4. This was black's last chance. If c takes b4, then bishop takes b4. But in our game, after rook takes a1, we have knight d7, and finally it was Fischer who played b4. Interestingly, immediately after the game, when Fischer spoke to Smyslov on the direct phone line, uh, Smyslov congratulated him on a beautiful performance and attributed his loss to his reluctance to play b4 at some point. With this move, Fischer is taking under control the c5 square, is restricting the movement of black pieces, and also black can no longer play b4, which could allow him to somewhat free his position. King f7 by Smyslov, knight f1, white is now starting to regroup his pieces, bishop d6, g3, knight f6, knight d2, king e7, rook a6. All the time Fischer is creating problems for his opponent. Knight b8, rook a5, forcing black to play c6. And now the pawn is occupying knight square and king g2. Knight bd7, meanwhile black is looking for a better square for his knight, but it seems like that there is none to be found. King f1, and now white will also bring his knight on d3. Rook c8, uh, in here Stockfish suggests rook b8 followed by rook b7, forming a fortress and trying to hold with that strong position, but instead we have rook c8, knight e1, knight e8, knight d3, knight c7, and c4. Fischer first put his pieces on the most active squares, and then he goes for a breakthrough, c4. Right now the threat is c5, that's why black captured on c4, and here we have an active knight on c4, knight b5, here comes rook a6, king f6, well, if knight b8, then rook a8 will follow, and then knight takes d6, again, white is winning. In our game after rook a6, king f6 was played and bishop c1. This time Fischer is bringing his bishop on the long diagonal. Bishop b8, bishop b2, and now white wants to go for f4 advancement. c5. And knight b6. We have the exchange of knights on b6. And now the knight is hanging. Also the pawn. c4 counterattacking white knight, but Fischer simply played knight c5. And by making c3 move, uh, Smyslov finally resigned. Because white can now move back his bishop on c1 and leave black in trouble. Your knight is hanging, what are you going to do with it? If knight d4, then knight d7 check will follow. Yes, threats were all over the board. Both knight d7 check, also the knight is hanging. That's why Smyslov resigned by making c3 move. This is one of the possible lines how white can realize his advantage. And then rook takes g7, it's over. That's why in our game after c3 we have a resignation. In his book Bobby Fischer Profile of a Prodigy, here is how Frank Brady describes Smyslov's resignation. The next morning a call came from Havana confirmed later by teletype that Smyslov was resigning but wanted to congratulate Bobby over the telephone. 
A short while later the phone rang. I answered it. Hello, Bobby? It was Smyslov. The Russian not only congratulated Fisher on his beautiful performance, but the two talked a while about variations that either could have played. Other players also called during the progress of the event, but the timing was off and off and the language barrier on and not many connected. This is it, dear chess lovers. I hope that you enjoyed this interesting game where Fisher demonstrated great endgame skills and I will see you in my next video. Take care.